Before we start the sermon, why don't we, why don't we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we prepare to enter your word once again, we pray for illumination. We pray for you to speak to us through your word. Lord, we know that your spirit speaks to us through your word. We know that he works in our hearts uh, to help it dwell deep within ourselves and change the way we think and act and just the way we are. So we ask again, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you would do your work in us. Open our ears to hear and our eyes to see, our minds to understand, and our hearts to believe. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> We're on a mission from God. That's the famous line from that classic 1980 film, The Blues Brothers. Jake and Elwood Blues are on a mission to save the or orphanage that they grew up in. They need to raise $5,000 in back taxes. Uh, so they reunite their old band and they tour the country playing gigs, getting into trouble wherever they go. But wherever they are, whenever people ask them what they're doing, their answer is always the same. We're on a mission from God. They know what their mission is, what they have to do. They are motivated to accomplish their mission, and nothing will stand in their way. Now, when it comes to the church, we can say the same thing as Jake and Elwood Blues. We're on a mission from God. I don't think that any of us would deny it. There's a reason that this church is here in this community. There's a reason that the church universal has lasted for over 2,000 years, there's a reason the church is growing in those other parts of the world where they have to stay underground and those places where Christianity is illegal, but they're still drawing people in to the community of God's people. As a church, we are on a mission from God. But what does that mean? What does that mean? <clears throat> Saying that we're on a mission is a far cry from knowing what that mission is, and where this mission should start from. So if we are on a mission from God as a church, where do we start? Where do we start? Yet before we get into our scripture passage this morning, I think it's important that we look at uh, three ways the church in the American context tends to operate, and how these three modes of operation can lead us astray. So the first one we could call, I call this the field of dreams mentality. If you build it, they will come. If our church looks more like this, if we only have this kind of program, if we institute these kind of events, then we expect that people will just flock to our churches. Somewhere there it has to be a magic key, right? A secret program that makes our church become the place to be. And it doesn't help when mega church pastors write books about the ways that they operate their ministries, implying that if you do exactly the same thing I did, then you can have a big church too. Now the problem with this mode of operation is that the gospel message is often reduced, and it becomes more about attitude, appearance, and programs. We need to ask if this way of doing church actually works. Now, Willow Creek Community Church in South Barrington, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, is a good case study. Anyone heard of Willow Creek Community Church? That's their building right there. It's huge. It's massive. It's one of the biggest churches in the nation. When Bill Heibel started Willow Creek, the intention was to be what he called seeker-sensitive, to make church more attractive to non-churchgoers and non-Christians. So you see, the worship space became, became more like an auditorium. The preaching became more practical. The music sounded more like Top 40 radio. Now, a few years ago, Willow Creek performed a big evaluation of their operation, everything that they were doing, and they found that their massive growth over the years, their massive growth over the years did not come by drawing in seekers, but by transfer growth. And that means Christians who left other churches to join Willow Creek. That was, that was the source of their massive growth. 
Not drawing in new people to the church, but church people who were a part of smaller churches. Now, Bill Hybels and his staff had the courage to say that when it came to achieving their initial goal of drawing in seekers, they failed. They failed. They had a plan, and they failed. They had the courage to say it. And they've been restructuring their church ever since to try and achieve this goal. And the hard reality we need to face is that we currently live within a culture of people who are not actively looking for a church to belong to. We assume they are. We assume that people who move into our communities are looking for a church, but they may not be. The majority of churches in America, like I've said before, are in plateau or decline. Even in our congregation, we may wonder where people are going who used to sit in the pews. The most realistic answer is that they're probably going nowhere for church. They're probably going nowhere for church. If you build it, they will come. doesn't seem to be working for us anymore. Programs, that's how most churches run. Programs are cosmetic. They're just surface level. level. Theology, understanding what the church is, that's deep. That's structural. And that is what we seem to be missing. A good theology of the church. Now the second issue we need to address is our focus on results. We can only speak from an American context. But for Americans, success usually is determined by numbers. Numbers. If our income is greater than our expenditures, we're doing good. If our population is growing, we're doing good. But is mission really about numbers? Do numbers equal success in God's economy? Now we're going to be looking at the mission of the prophet Isaiah today. But let's take a listen to what God's mission for Isaiah was. This is what God told Isaiah his ministry was going to be. And he, that is God, said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Anyone out there want to volunteer for this mission? Go talk to these people, but they're not going to understand you. They're not going to listen to what you have to say. Anyone want that mission? I wouldn't. Yet this is what God had in store for Isaiah. His message was about destruction, about salvation, about restoration. And it was not to end. He wasn't supposed to change his message just because God said that it would fall upon deaf ears and fat, calloused hearts. God knew the results. God already knew the results, but the mission remained the same. And the fact is that when we focus on the numbers, we can get pretty discouraged. Because the numbers of members may be falling, the number of funerals may be rising, the number of baptisms is slim to none. William Carey, who's um, on the picture on well, your left. I never know my right from my left. The only reason I do is because I have a big scar on my left hand. So, On your left, that's William Carey. He's considered the father of modern missions. He paved the way for the way missionary work is done today. He did his missionary work in India. He translated the Bible into two Indian dialects. But it was seven years, seven years on the field, before he saw his first convert. And not to mention that during his ministry in India, he buried his first wife and multiple children. The other picture that you see is J. Hudson Taylor, considered a pioneer missionary in China. He worked hard to have his missionary team understand Chinese culture, adopt Chinese customs. You see here, he's... He's dressed in a Chinese manner, Chinese clothes, the way a Chinese person would have their facial hair. But Taylor never saw a convert during his ministry. Never. It was his greatest discouragement that he never saw anybody during his ministry become a Christian. The fruit of his labors would be seen by missionaries who picked picked up where he left off long after he was dead. 
And I know for myself and my family's plan to Taiwan that global missions has only resulted in about 4.5% of the population accepting the gospel. Only 4.5% of the population of Taiwan consider themselves Christian. For the Hakka people that our missionaries have normally worked with, that number is 0.3%. Three out of a thousand are Christians. But God's mission is not run by numbers. The third attitude that we need to address is the assumption that missionaries are those people who go to foreign countries. And in one sense, we can agree. The word missionary comes from a Latin word, missio, which means sent, to send. But missionaries don't have to go overseas. Missionaries can be sent into our communities, and our communities are changing very dramatically. Wouldn't we, believe, wouldn't we agree that our community here has changed very dramatically over the years? We may not have to go to the nations because the nations are coming to us. The Phillips neighborhood in Minneapolis is one of the most diverse in the nation. You can go to the Cub Foods on Lake Street and you can hear 150 different languages being spoken on any given day. 150 different languages. Near my hometown, the city of Pelican Rapids has seen a rise in Hispanic, Somali, Bosnian, and Ukrainian immigrants over the years. Wherever you have a meat pack packing plant, you get immigrants. Um, they have a meat packing plant. And I know that churches in the area are wondering what they're going to do because the Somali community is building a mosque in their community, and the churches say, what are we going to do? And I ask, who is going to be sent with the gospel to the Muslim community that's living in your midst. Here's a mission to people who are living in your neighborhoods. So if we are on a mission from God, if we're on a mission from God, where do we start from? Where do we start from? As we look at our passage this morning, let's take a look. Isaiah 6, looking at the first eight verses. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. As we think about this passage this morning, as we see what it has to tell us about what it means to be a church in mission, I want to put forward that mission starts from context. Mission starts from context. The first context is who God is. Who is God? God is holy. And holy means set apart. But he's not just holy, he is holy, 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 like we sang this morning. Three times holy. It is Trinity Sunday after all. God is above us. He's beyond us. He is totally other than us. He is set apart. Upon his throne, even his robe fills the temple, as Isaiah saw. Seraphim, they hover around him. They're continually singing his praises. They sing so loud the foundations of the doorpost shake. They cover their feet, they cover their eyes with one set of wings because they can't even bear to look at God. They cover their feet with another set of wings because they fear to offend God. What we read 
of Isaiah's vision is hard to conceptualize. There's an artist rendering here, but how can anyone do justice to this amazing visual experience? And yet this imagery is not just for the sake of itself or to give a complete visual of what God is like. It's not for us to say, aha, that's what God looks like. What Isaiah saw reveals to us the nature of who God is as our creator. Holy, holy, holy. Set apart other than us. God is not like us. and We are not like him. And it is interesting to note that Isaiah calls God the king. The special mission that God has for Isaiah starts in the year that King Uzziah died. And Uzziah was a good king. He was a faithful king. He was faithful to the God of his fathers. Under Uzziah's rule, the nation of Israel prospered, grew. Next in line for the throne is Ahaz. Ahaz is a wicked king. He does not honor the one true God. He sacrifices to pagan gods. And the people of Israel are in turmoil. They're in turmoil. The good king is dead. A wicked king is ascending the throne. But God is the true king over all the kings of the earth. And as king, God is sending Isaiah as his delegate, as his ambassador. This mission is God's mission. It's never our own. He is the king. He is in control. And it's his message we bear. It is he who sends us into this world with the gospel. This starts from the knowledge that our God is, he's a missionary God. He is. He's a missionary God. A sending God. A God who sends himself to us. As Jesus said in the Gospel of John, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. This God who sent himself to us in the person of his Son, and the Father and the Son who sent to us the Holy Spirit, this triune God that we worship today, he sends us on his mission. God's on a mission. And he is inviting us to join him. We then turn to the context of who we are in relation to God. And Isaiah knows exactly where he stands in relation to God. As soon as he realizes God's holiness, his transcendence, his otherness, these are the words that Isaiah cries out, Woe is me! I am lost! And it's this word that he says, I am lost. This word for lost can also mean ruined. It's this word that is very important for us. It's been translated sometimes as undone. I am undone. <clears throat> it's a very pregnant word. It's a word that's used for silence in the face of a catastrophe. A word that belongs to legal court language. Someone who is silent because they've received a guilty verdict. Isaiah's words would be best expressed as, I've been brought to silence. Or maybe even better yet, I am doomed. I am doomed. Isaiah knows he stands guilty before God. He's silent because he has no defense. God is transcendent and holy. He cannot bear to be in the presence of sin. Right? God told Moses, none may see me and live. None may see me and live. And the fact that Isaiah sees the king, he sees the Lord... As one who is guilty of unclean lips, as he has confessed, this is a catastrophe. Isaiah knows he's going to die. He cannot stand guilty in God's presence and live. And likewise, we all stand guilty in the presence of God because of our sin. There is nothing in and of ourselves that would make us acceptable to stand before God. We must all realize our own context and cry out like Isaiah, Woe is me. I am guilty. Woe is me, I'm guilty. And yet the amazing thing is, Isaiah is somehow meant to be here. He's meant to be in the presence of God. He's meant to see this vision. But God has to do something about Isaiah's guilt to make this possible. God has to do something about Isaiah's guilt to make this possible. And that's why the seraph goes to the altar and grabs the coal. It's why the seraph touched the coal to Isaiah's mouth. Because it's upon the altar that sacrifices were offered to God. 
It is upon the altar that sins were paid for. And it is for this reason that the author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ was our sacrifice once and for all, offered upon the altar to pay for our sins. Our text from Isaiah 6 tells us that that two things happened when the coal touched Isaiah's lips. First, his iniquity was taken away. The guilty verdict is gone. As the psalmist writes, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. Second, Isaiah's sin was atoned for. His rebellious deeds were covered by God's grace. And this was the only way, the only way that Isaiah could stand in the presence of God. And it's the same for us. If we truly understand our context, if we're honest about it, and we can say we're guilty and we're sinful before God, that it's Jesus who intercedes for us, like the seraph did for Isaiah. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, our iniquity is taken away, our sin is covered. We can approach God's throne, the throne of grace, with confidence. To come before God, to be called into his mission, is first of all, to be a sinner saved by grace. Our final context concerns our relation to those that we live among. Those we are called to, those that we are sent to. Isaiah expressed himself as a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah knew his context was none different, none better than those he lived among. If our sin makes us guilty before God, then we live among guilty people, right? If our sin makes us guilty before God, everyone else we live with is guilty. But Isaiah's context and our context as this church are still quite different from those that we live among. Isaiah was called out, right? Called out to stand in the presence of God. And as a church, we are called out. The Greek word for church is ekklesia, which literally means called out, those who are called out. As a church, we're called out from this world, aren't we, right? We're called out from this world. But we don't stay there. We don't stand on the fringe and just expect that everybody else is going to come to us. In the Nicene Creed, if we confess the Nicene Creed, we confess we're an apostolic church. And the word apostle means one who is sent. If we believe and we confess that we are an apostolic church, then we are a sent church. In the past year, I've been helping us work with a definition of what it means to be the church that comes from a theologian named Patrick Kiefert. And we express that as a church we're called, we're gathered, we're centered, and then we're sent. We're called out from this world. We're gathered around the ministry of word and sacrament. We're centered in the message of the gospel. And then we're sent back into the world with that same message. Isaiah was called out But he was also sent back in. Isaiah was sent back to these people of unclean lips with the gospel message of God's salvation and God's deliverance. And this alerts us to be aware of our own own context. There's an old Sesame Street song that goes, Who are the people in your neighborhood? The people who you see each day. I once had a conversation with a pastor who served a Nazarene church in Minot. And he said one of the first things he did when he started was to call all the people who lived in a three-block radius of the church and ask them what they thought of the church. And he told me that the neighborhood didn't even know they were there. The neighborhood didn't even know they were there. They passed the church every day. The neighbors didn't even know, they didn't even know the name of the church. They passed it every day. They didn't even know the name of the church. He told me it was because the people in the church forgot who their neighbors were. People in the church forgot who their neighbors were. And how can we expect our neighbors to join us and become a member of God's family unless we know 
who they are. Unless we go and we show them God's love that is in Jesus Christ. Even the way we understand the context of our neighborhood starts with, woe is me. Because our neighbors are as in much in need of God's grace as we are. Our neighbors are as in much in need of God's grace as we are. And what is Isaiah's response to all of this mission stuff? What does Isaiah say? Here am I. Here am I. Send me. I'm going to go on this mission. But mission starts with context. Mission starts with context. There can be no here am I. You can't say here am I without first saying woe is me. You can't say here am I without first saying woe is me. To be on a mission from God means to understand who God is, who we are, and who we are sent to. Our churches are on a mission from God because it's his mission. It's his mission. And he is the one who equips us to reach out to our neighbors with the gospel. Being sent on mission doesn't necessarily mean that we hop on the next airplane to Chad or Taiwan. To be a missionary to a foreign country, that's a very specific calling. But we're all sent. We're all missionaries. We're all missionaries. Being sent sometimes is nothing more than knocking on your neighbor's door, inviting them to dinner, really getting invested in their lives, and living out the gospel in word and in deed. Mission is an everyday kind of thing, but it always starts with context. And the context is that our God, who sent himself to us, sends us out on a mission. He has called you. He's equipping you. He is sending you, Ebenezer Lutheran Brethren Church. You are on a mission from God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a missionary God who sent your son to us. When your son ascended and was seated at the right hand of God the Father, you sent us the Holy Spirit. You are sending God. You are a missionary God. Remind us of that. Remind us that we're all missionaries. We're all sent with the message of the gospel for the sake of others. So we thank you for the call of Isaiah, that it is our call as well. Lord, you are looking for somebody to send. And help us to say, here am I, send me. But that can only start when we understand who we are, when we understand what this mission's all about, is to save sinners. Lord, and like the Apostle Paul, may we have the courage to say that you have come to save sinners of of whom we are the worst. Lord, we are people of unclean lips, and we live amongst the people of unclean lips, and our eyes have seen the Lord, but through your Son, Jesus, you've forgiven us. You've taken that guilt away. You've atoned for our sin. And we're so thankful. Help us to have the desire to tell others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.